So indeed, first of all, you know, thank you for coming in the rain. And also, I think probably you know, there are a few more people joining online. Uh, and it is indeed a, um, very interesting that I presented this study so many times in so many different places in different countries, but I never had a chance to present it actually at SSA. So I think that would be an interesting opportunity. Um, and before I get into you know, methodological details and how it all started, I just wanted to think, so I wanted you to think for a while, when was the last time when you went to bed hungry? Uh, not because you were on a diet or intermittent fasting, right? Not because um, you were trying to lose weight, but because there was not enough food in the household, right? Or when was the last time that you ate only once a day, right? And think also if that happened, and for some of you it could be a very new reality, but for some of you it could be something very familiar, right? And then think that it happened that not only once and not only twice, but it was a chronic feeling. And what it would do to you, how would that make you feel? And imagine that on top of that, you would also have to care for maybe four or five children, right? You would have to care for a husband. You also need to figure out what to do the next day, to do your washing, drying, cleaning, everything by hand, often without any hot water. And then on top of that, if someone would ask you to actually attend mental health services for your kids, right? So how would you feel and how would you feel that you would improve, right? And how would you progress and how would your kids progress? And I think the idea is that I ask you to think about that and maybe Remember some of those feelings, what it made you feel when you really have no idea when the next meal is coming. But also think of it as how do we position and how do we develop services, mental health services for people you know, who are indeed struggling you know, with depression and anxiety, but that may not necessarily come from uh, the neurobiological uh, uh, dysfunctions in the brain, right? But that might be probably related to um, external stressors, right? And whether the interventions that we're trying to provide to these people, whether they do necessarily match the, the context that they live. Okay? So I hope that you keep that image in mind. And as we go through, you would see you know, how that is uh, related. So first of all, a couple of years ago, uh, one of the um, issues of SSA magazine featured this story. So uh, if you would be interested, uh, you can find it also online. And we also, I think, have hard copies downstairs. But to set it in perspective, so first of all, the idea of the project started with kids who are exposed to child labor. And overall, globally now, there are around 168 million of kids between the ages 5 to 14 who are working. And uh, just a couple of years before that, the number was over 200 million. And the reason we were able to, uh, on one hand, you would think that, oh, my God, you know, we achieved some progress that we managed to uh, slash the number by, by like 40 million people, but it's actually not the case. It's not because we were able to find good solutions, it's just because we changed the number, the age range that we considered. Before it was just the kids who were up to the age of 17, and now the number has reduced to kids who are working in between the five and 14. But the idea is that this issue is very uh, prevalent. Uh, countries in West Africa are particularly experiencing uh, highest uh, prevalence of kids involved in labor, and Burkina Faso is one of the uh, highest uh, prevalence rates with almost over you know, a third of kids in this age range actually working, right, to supplement income for parents. And why is that happening? Partially, um, Burkina Faso, and specifically the northern, the north region where the study took place, is experiencing ultra-level uh, poverty, right? So this is, uh, and the way we define ultra-level poverty, it's not just poor, but it's the poorest of the poor, right? And it is also partially related to food insecurity that depends on the geography, and I will show it to you a little bit later. Overall, we're talking about the study that is taking place here, bordering countries with Mali, Niger, and um, Ivory Coast, and Ghana. And once kids or families are living in uh, chronic adversity, experiencing chronic hunger, chronic uh, poverty, it is known to also put kids at risk for a number of child protection issues, right? We're talking specifically about the cases when kids are sent away to work in gold mines, in cocoa plants, in cotton fields, and in, um, did I mention all of them? Yes, there are, might be a couple of others, but these are the most common uh, places where kids are sent away to work. Kids are also sent to religious schools just because parents cannot support uh, their traditional schooling. They cannot pay, so they send them away uh, to study in religious schools. And some, and especially girls, they're being married off early just because parents cannot continue their education and the financial burden is reduced when girls uh, marry off earlier. Right? So in a way, a lot of international organizations 
have known that uh, poverty is strongly associated with a number of child protection issues, but they thought, and they're actually very actively now promoting economic interventions in uh, low resource settings, but they say we don't really have enough evidence that truly shows that if you provide um, some economic resources to these families that we can actually improve protection outcomes for kids, right? So this was the idea is that we, they approached us and um, they said, can we actually test it, right? Uh, and specifically, they were interested um, not only kids who are working, because we know once kids start working, it makes them exposed uh, at a higher risk to violence, right, and exploitation. And um, some of the examples, it would be being involved in hazardous labor, meaning carrying heavy loads, heavy, you know, the, for their uh, body weight, working with chemicals and toxins, especially if they're working in, in a farming area or uh, with animals, and uh, working in undergrounds in small places, dark places, being exposed to gas um, uh, and um, high temperatures and et cetera, right? There are some cases when kids in these places, or specifically in Burkina Faso, may be also in for, involved in worst forms of child labor. These are examples of slavery, debt bondage, meaning when parents cannot pay the debt, the person who they owe to, they can come and either take their child, temporary, right, while they're gonna pay it off, or the kid would work for them to pay off the debt, right? And when girls are, for example, often working as um, domestic aides, they are often at very high risk for child sexual abuse, right? And boys are often usually at high risk for physical abuse, right? And sometimes they can be also um, forced to beg and things like that. So we know that it's not just the issue though whether they, the families uh, of almost have no choice but to involve their kids in supplementing the income. It's just this exposure puts them at higher risk for exposure to violence exploitation. And again, uh, when the organization approached us, they primarily were making the assumption that if we address the issue related to poverty, hopefully these other issues will also improve, right? But coming also from the field of you know, social work, we understand that all these issues are very complicated and complex, and while poverty is one of the important underlying issues, there are potentially many other factors that could play a role in making a decision whether to send kids away to work, whether to marry them, or how to discipline them. And therefore we thought that, how about we also think about other potential factors such as cultural norms or lack of uh, information or any other kind of things that are more sociocultural that take place uh, in making this decision. And therefore, in addition to just only looking at the economic piece, we would also uh, partner with another organization that would help us address this kind of a family-related issues, right? Um, the work is being guided by two theories, asset theory that actually um, uh, focuses primarily on the economic piece that states that when we provide productive assets to low-income families, and by productive assets we don't mean just cash, right, because cash can be easily depleted. We do not mean microcredits or any kind of credits because that may actually put burden on families trying to repay them and repay the interest. But we actually talk about productive assets that can generate further income, such as income generating activities or savings or any kind of investments, right, that could that further produce uh, income for the family. And the idea is that um, as a theory states that these productive investments would have long-term psychological and social benefits that often go beyond economic gains, right? An example, now the family would be able to not only feed the kids, right, but to actually invest in education, right? Or they would not have the need to send them away. Uh, but also knowing that we do not function in a vacuum in between children and families that are very complicated interactions and also between husbands and wives, it was important for us to also think of the uh, theory that describes this family relationships, right? And we were thinking of family resilience theory that is also suggesting that in addition to economic assets, for kids living in a situation of chronic stress and adversity, it is important to be connected to supportive uh, adults or family members. And also by investing in families, we could restore the family relationships and the, um, probably change the parenting decisions and behaviors. And the reason we thought about that is because while parent, supportive parenting has always been you know, an important factor, protective factor for emotional well-being for kids, we also know that parental stress that is often poverty-induced could be uh, 
an important risk factor for poor mental health among kids. Okay? And we knew that if we only try to provide family type of relationship without addressing the poverty, right, we may not be able to reduce the, the stress um, that parents are experiencing. Right? So therefore, the idea for us was to actually test both the asset theory, but also in combination, alone and in combination with the uh, family resilience theory. So this is the conceptual model that we choose. So we have two types of intervention, two separate components. And uh, the child outcomes we were in general looking at, it's the uh, family separation that kids are not separated early enough, either due to work, marriage, or schooling. That will hopefully also be um, impacting their exposure to violence exploita and exploitation. And hopefully all of that would also contribute to their improved emotional well-being. And that's the piece on child mental health work coming, right? And we were primarily looking at depression, self-esteem, and trauma. You had a question, and yeah. Disease and disability is a big driver of poverty, and you don't, I don't see that mentioned here. It is true, yes. We were not looking that much specifically here. It is the case, maybe a little bit less the disability, but physical illness was very big factor there, as we learned later on. Yes. So, so Medical interventions is another dimension here. That, that it is, and that's actually, uh, and I would be happy to come back to that once we start talking about the setting, because you're absolutely right that um, medical interventions are important, but you will see that we're working in villages that extremely small, um, extremely remote, and that do not have pretty much any resources, right? And the question is, how do we actually start helping people, right? who live in conditions like that, and how do maybe in the future we, people for whom these preventive interventions are not really helping, then those who are truly in need and cannot improve, how do we later can connect them to services? But to help with medical interventions to all of the you know, uh, residents in the, you know, these small villages would be, at least in those situations, not entirely feasible. But it is absolutely true. The question is not because it's not effective, it's is it feasible in these circumstances, and what do we do given this uh, environment. And by the way, yeah, because since, you know, we have uh, more time than in a typical presentation and uh, it's more kind of an uh, uh, open environment, so if you have any kind of clarifying questions, feel free to ask. We'll leave more time at the end for discussion, but if anything that is not clear as we go, please go ahead and ask. So these were our main outcomes, and our hypothetical mediators were, first of all, you know, improve the economic well-being, both food insecurity, so there's more food on the table, household assets, and reduction in debt. Also, uh, the idea was to see if improving woman's status, right, that she's able to actually make decisions, contribute to the household um, income, and participate in decision-making around the child, whether that would also play any role, and also issues related to kind of parent beliefs and behaviors around par parenting and child protection. And I will mention why specifically women's empowerment, because that not, was not necessarily my choice, but that was kind of dictated by the choice of the intervention. So overall, the study aim was to, to test the effects of economic empowerment alone and in combination with a family coaching component on child protective and mental health outcomes in ultra poor families in North uh, region of Burkina Faso. So this is the setting where we were conducting the study. So for example, you know, these are the houses, this is the places where they kept food uh, that they would collect you know, once a year and it's stored for the next uh, year. So these are examples of the um, sites where sometimes people are working. So here, for the most part, you see adults, but they very often engage kids as well, because when we talk about gold mines, um, um, these places require people who could um, sort through um, stones, right, and sand, so that requires someone with very small hands and good motor skills, right, but also to digging into the um, caves, you also need someone who is fairly small. So therefore, kids are very often used in this kind of places. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they go with their parents, right? And by go, I don't mean they come back home at night. They would stay there for months, right? Um, and sometimes it could be just kids. So we focused on the northern region of Burkina Faso, right? Specifically on Barga community. And that is located in Sahel uh, region, 
that is the one that goes right before uh, Sahara Desert, right? So it is a very dry area with very low uh, soil productivity and with cyclical droughts. So therefore, geography determines that it's already very difficult to get uh, food or anything kind of um, uh, to grow. And we chose it specifically uh, for a very high level of poverty and very limited economic resources and very limited interventions from any other places, right? So these were the places that were poor even by Burkina Faso standards. And Burkina Faso is actually one of the 48 countries on the, uh, not just low income countries, but the least developed countries. So the 12 pilot villages that we chose were comparable on socioeconomic indicators. We looked at poorest yield for crops also limited access to clean water and very, very limited, if any, interventions from any NGOs or any organizations, right? Because it's far, almost pretty much nobody gets there. Uh, we also looked at, um, so that they would be comparable in the population size, ethnic homogeneity, and also distance from urban centers. Once we identified villages, within those villages we also selected households and we went through a participatory wealth ranking exercise that was actually developed by organization, the local organization we were working with. What they were doing that since poverty indicators may vary across countries and places because in one place having a bicycle is not an indicator of wealth, in another it may be. So communities define themselves what it means to be very poor here or what it means to be a little bit wealthy, right? So. And based on that, so once we had a list of indicators, what to look for, then the families were assessed. What did they have? And they, and they divided into groups. So the lowest group that pretty much you know, was on the lowest quintile was invited to participate. And we targeted specifically households that had children between ages 10 to 15. Uh, the reason we focused on this age is because uh, kids, once they grow, this is the age when they are particularly at risk for being involved in child labor, but also for marrying off and leaving the places. So this is uh, the age where we thought we could also see more effects, right? Um, being in line with local uh, traditions, before we could approach family, uh, mothers or children, we had to ask permission from the um, heads of the household. So only the households where the husband would agree for the family to be involved, they were, uh, after that, we proceeded to actually contact the mother and the child uh, to invite them in the study. Um, we had 360 households, about 30 households per village. And uh, I will explain later why it was specifically the female households that were select, uh, caregivers that were selected to be interviewed. So in each household, we interviewed one uh, female caregiver. Uh, some of them were biological mothers, the majority, right? But some were also non-biological mothers. So they were caring either, you know, it could be a grandmother, but usually it could be one of the wives caring for the kids if their mom passed away, or it could be you know, cousins or nephews and et cetera. And then one eligible child, um, even though only one eligible child in the age of 10 to 15 was interviewed, we still collected information about all other kids through the mother, okay? All the younger kids were. So altogether we had, uh, 360 uh, female caregivers and 360 children. So overall, uh, when we had initially more villages, we excluded three of them because of the ethnic heterogeneity that uh, we tried to keep uh, the sample a little bit more cohesive. We randomized at the village level. So four villages were assigned to control group, which basically uh, served as a wait list. The economic intervention only, and then the uh, economic plus. So that's where we can buy the family component with the economic. The reason we conducted uh, randomization at the village level, obviously um, because of the ethical concerns that become even uh, more important once you deliver economic intervention. Because when we were working with uh, uh, you know, community leaders, they said there is no way we can explain the concept that it was random, right? If all these, you know, let's say 20 families were eligible, we cannot tell 10 of them that, oops, randomly you were not selected. They say they would not trust us because they're all neighbors. They live right next to each other and they say maybe they paid you the money so that they could be in the study, right? And, you know, participate in this program. So therefore, the decision was made that everyone who lived in that village that was assigned to one condition, everyone in that village will receive the same intervention. And since villages were fairly and kind of separated from each other, there would also not be a lot of cross-arm uh, contamination. Yes. Can you 
you try to get an equal number of uh, male children and female children? Not so much, no, no, we didn't. Eventually it was around maybe 60% were boys you will see, but we did not specifically try to balance on that. Mm -hmm. and what was your participation rate? We'll get to that. Oh. Yes. <laughs> I think maybe, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think anything that is clarifying that is here, yeah. Uh. How many, maybe this, it's the same question, just did you have any um, heads of households who said no, that you couldn't contact them? Not really. Not really. Pretty much everyone wanted to be involved because they thought places that have literally no opportunities. This was a huge, because they didn't feel there would be a lot of risks or losses. And when you bring, unfortunately, when you bring an economic intervention in a setting that is so, um, you know, com uh, that lacks so many things, that really represents an opportunity. Plus, I think that was one. So the, the benefits seemed very high. Second, uh, we spent two years planning the study, which seemed a lot, right? And we were very worried that we were almost delayed it by a year. But looking back, there would be no way to do it otherwise because the relationships that were built in the community, and again, it wasn't me who was doing it. Obviously, I would be a complete stranger there. But everything was done through local leaders, through local organizations that were working very hard. And they, um, so by the time they build rapport with the um, uh, families or with the, basically not even the families themselves, but with the community patriarchs or kind of leaders, right? So the idea of having an intervention was very welcomed, right? So it did not seem like something strange. But I think if we just showed up, so that we're going to organize a town hall meeting. If you guys want to participate, come in, then probably participation rates would be very low. Yeah. Can I ask a question about sure. The control um, you said it's a wait list. It's a wait list. So we, once we finish the intervention, two years later, we deliver the intervention here, which logistically was also nice because what happens is these are, and in, in a slide I will show you how the intervention looked like. So um, these are saving groups, okay? So therefore, even the organization that trickle up that was delivering the intervention, they don't have so many resources to work at the same time in so many villages. So they often roll out the intervention from one place to another. So therefore, by the time they worked here and finished, they were ready to roll out in another place. It's just this. Um, so that's why it worked well, because they agreed to wait for two years, but they knew they're going to get it. And that was another issue why we also decided to do it, um, not just a pure control, because yeah, uh, it would not be uh, ethically OK. Overall, uh, we, in terms of adults, we only uh, lost one adult uh, throughout two years. There was only one mother who had to move to another village to care for her mom. And everyone else stayed uh, there without moving much. But we had a, a little bit higher, uh, higher dropout rates for kids. And not necessarily dropout, these were the kids. They already all finished the intervention. It's just by the time of the uh, third wave, or basically two years later when we were conducting the follow-up, um, some of them already got married or moved because of work, so it was harder to reach them. Right? But it's not because they dropped out from the intervention, but it was, uh, they were lost to follow-up. Yes? That's a good one. And to be honest, I don't know. For, I think that's a very good question. And these were not very big villages, right? So these were fairly small, and you can walk around the entire village maybe in 30 minutes, right? So these were small pockets of houses, right? Uh, so but exactly how many? That's a very good question. I don't know for sure. Um, so now about the intervention itself. Uh, the economic piece used the graduation model that comes from uh, BRAC um, organization, a big organization in Bangladesh that what I learned only recently was actually set up by a social worker, uh, a Bangladesh social worker. And the idea of the graduation model was um, that a lot of kind of microfinancing that was introduced to low income uh, communities were really not targeting the poorest of the poor because to be able to participate in uh, microfinance, you already need to have some certain, you know, initial maybe entrepreneurial skills, initial uh, um, capital in terms of the connections, like social capital, right, uh, and ability to do it, and actually have some kind of minimal resources to be involved. The question is they were not really targeting people who had nothing at all and have never done that before. 
And the idea was that we knew that there were separate, several separate components that would be essential, right? And then they tried to kind of put them all together as one package. So one component was saving groups formation. So in these villages, you would form a group of, uh, and this one specifically was focusing uh, on women. Uh, these would be savings groups, and the idea is that they would not only save together, but serve also as social support and kind of a solidarity group for each other. In addition to that, there would be also training on livelihood and household ministry. It's basically not only that now you're able to save, but actually what you can do and how, right? So they were teaching them, they had a curriculum on uh, livelihood training. But then it's also hard to teach it if you have nothing to start with. So therefore, one of the components was also having a seed grants in the amount of close to $100, which is a fairly big amount for uh, that community or for that level, to actually jump, jump start some of these activities. Most uh, frequently used one eventually became you know, uh, animal husbandry and kind of small scale vending. And on top of that, it was also hard to just start it and leave them alone. So they had this monthly or bi-weekly one-on-one -on -one mentoring and coaching sessions. So that's where the same uh, trainers that were delivering it in groups, they would also come and check on each household to see how the woman is doing, if she's able to use information that she learned, how her business is going, how her uh, family. And that was pretty much the economic intervention, right? And the organization that uh, we were partnering with, they were hoping that if we deliver this, or if they deliver this, that would also, the family would have more uh, kind of assets or more household kind of more funds, right? Uh, and therefore, that will prevent them from sending kids away, from marrying, and so the expectations were very high, right? That, and the reason they decided to target specifically women because uh, we know the uh, issue of kind of a gendered poverty that women are often considered to be at the highest risk for poverty, and therefore they thought, how about we intervene directly at women, right? Plus, it seemed that anything, and that's a very common thought in many international organizations that women are also more responsible in terms of how money is spent and they're not going to spend it on themselves or anything else, but they're going to spend it on kids and family needs, right? But we also know that targeting only women, right, in a fairly traditional place, right, is very risky because it may distort traditional norms and dynamics and relationships that existed for years and uh, decades and possibly centuries, right? So therefore, for me originally, it was problematic that this intervention only targeted women, but we also didn't want to um, modify it much just because this was the model that it implemented in so many countries, and we wanted to use it as a comparison, and instead actually add the, economic, uh, the family coaching component that um, actually targeted all members of the household. Whoever lived in the family, they would be invited to come to the meetings. And that often meant not only husbands, co-wives, and children, but also that also meant in-laws if they were living together, and often they were, right? It would be usually the husband's parents, and they would also be often considered the patriarchs in the family, and they are the ones who often make the main decisions, okay? Um, and this family coaching, again, we named it this way. It's not maybe the most original or interesting title. They called it sensitization, right? We thought, you know, sensitization seemed a little bit um, difficult to comprehend. So anyway, it goes by both names. But the idea is that during the coaching meetings that women were already receiving in the previous intervention, in addition to talking to her about the economic piece, entire family would be invited uh, to also talk about child protection issues, right? And they had specifically five topics. It's schooling for children, violence and disciplining, um, trafficking and sending you know, kids who are in worse forms of child labor, decisions around uh, marriage, and also begging, because that was a common uh, thing happening in a lot of uh, religious schools. It was delivered by trained facilitators once a month at participants' homes. So that was they didn't have to go anywhere, travel anywhere, etc. And the idea why we kind of called it coaching and not necessarily parent skills training or anything else, and it wasn't the information delivering, because we weren't necessarily giving them a lot of new information. The idea behind this project was really focusing on two things, without really disrupting local ways of being. For example, we didn't say that don't marry your girls, right? Because we thought we don't have a lot of sessions to work on it. We don't have even a lot of power to actually change these things, right? We wanted to see what can we do to reduce the effects on kids, right? To at least, given the circumstances, what can we do to improve the outcomes for kids? That's one. 
And it was done in two ways, using kind of appreciative inquiry, meaning questioning without judgment. So if this, is, if this is the family that is trying to make that decision, right? So what is driving this decision, right? What are the concerns they're trying to address? So they say, okay, I need to marry my girl because you know, I cannot, continue, I cannot afford continuing her studying, right? And then plus, you know, nobody else would wanna marry her. And then we would move to uh, joint problem solving. So they say, okay, if he, she already has a husband, right? Can he make sure that once they marry, she continues studying, being in school, right? And it's covered by him. So those kind of decisions, they were not really, um, mm, yeah, so basically trying to figure out, given the local resources, how can uh, we improve the uh, decision making or problem solving around certain issues? And another different idea is that it was the first time when they were actually sitting all together and were able to kind of have those conversations, right? Because very, before the decisions were just made without actually talking through uh, that a lot. And this was delivered by um, the local organization, the community-based organization, Adefad. Madame Truare, maybe you don't see her well, but she's a very influential figure. So, and she was one of the main facilitators and she runs that organization. And when she comes in, everyone listens, right? <laughs> and everyone is captivated. So she was a very, very big part of the success, I think. Um, can I just ask a question about, um, you, you said that if you go back to the past, the, next, the previous slide. So it sounds like the families knew about the issues A through E. Yeah, it wasn't new, exactly. Yeah. I mean, they must, because they talk and... And they know it's happening, yeah. And so, yeah, I guess, um, what is new about it? Yeah, I mean, how, because you would think, if, if, I mean, was part of it a denial that, yeah, I hear it happens, but I don't want to believe it really happens? Mm -hmm. Or was it, um, it's not as bad as people say it is? Or, um, I, I don't know, or do you worry how much of it, if you change their, this sort of joint problem solving, did they find a solution to the problem or were they just felt this bias I think all of three, because the situations were always different, right? Uh, one, it could be really not knowing, because uh, one example, uh, many of the families could send their girls to work in the capital in Ouagadougou as aides or as maids in the household. For many of them, that was considered a sense of prestige because my child works in the capital, and they think that they're making money that they would be able to send home without realizing that girls often are actually sexually abused once they go there, because this is something that their daughter probably would never tell them, mm -hmm. right? And something that maybe not a lot of people in the community would discuss, right? But from the research, from the literature, we know that that's what happens, right? And maybe from kind of a larger study in the capital. So one is literally not really being fully aware, aware of all the risks, because once it's really, it's almost, I think when people are, uh, trafficked for work, you know, they're uh, telling the stories that you can make the, without knowing that they can take your passport and you actually have no rights. So sometimes it's truly not knowing what to expect, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, another thing is maybe not realizing how damaging some of it can be because again, for example, issues related with uh, not giving kids a voice, yelling at them, that was very normative, right? Uh, without truly understanding what it means. Um, and when we talk about uh, joint problem solving, that's not only family members together, but it's also actually, I probably should have added, using local resources, because families were trying to address these issues within their own family without realizing, can they tap into existing resources that there are? And often those resources, again, they're not massive, but maybe in some situations, maybe a local leader could negotiate something and make some exceptions or arrangements when it comes to school and when it comes to something else, right? Or getting a kid, because sometimes they would send them away to a school because there was a school and there was nothing else that was here, right? Mm -hmm. So these are kind of more circumstances like that, okay? So data collection, again, we had to convene a local community advisory board that consisted of uh, um, either psychologists or people involved in child welfare or working with uh, children and families in the country. We wouldn't have done that without them. Uh, we used interviewer-administered surveys just because of the literacy level was very low, so it would not be possible to rely on self-administered instruments. We did it at one-year follow-up and actually also at two-year follow-ups. We also had to use administrative data from saving diaries or diaries uh, on um, uh, how savings were going, and we used um, 
Uh, we worked with uh, graduate students from uh, psychology and sociology departments at the University of Ouagadougou. So uh, these are, you know, how we were, uh, so we also did all the data entry in country, so we trained them in SPSS, and it was uh, like seven hours of training when we were already exhausted, we couldn't talk, but say, could you please <laughs> also show us this and that? So they were really eager to learn, and I think for them just being able to involve them, all of the steps of the study from the beginning till the end was really, really um, uh, motivating. So they didn't even want to break for lunch, they just wanted to really learn all of these th things. So that was really uh, encouraging. So we had to have all instruments in French and more and more is the local language. French is the um, uh, language, national language. So, and that was another challenge. So, and I will mention that in a couple of talks. So first of all, we had to have a number of instruments that look specifically at child labor, where kids work, for how long, uh, was anybody physically, sexually, or um, emotionally abusing them, for how many hours, were they paid, did they do it during work hours, in the evenings, and et cetera. So it was a very extensive uh, survey on, from uh, um, international labor organizations. We also looked at the emotional well-being uh, using the um, depression scale, self-esteem, and tra trauma symptom scale. There are better scales, more comprehensive on PTSD. We specifically use this one because it's short. It has very short and very clear sentences, which is much, was easier for kids to understand, right? So that here it was a chance where we had to balance between comprehension and actually the depth of the analysis uh, of the instrument. Uh, and for, for caregivers, we look both at economic outcomes and uh, food insecurity, at child protection. So if kids who are not currently in the household, do they have any kids who are studying away, working away? Um, uh, also about their attitudes and norms, and also about their parental well-being, stress and depression, and also uh, women's empowerment. The story with the language, and I can, we can talk more about it uh, in the discussion if you're interested, but it's very, it was unique for me and uh, fairly complicated because I work in other places in other languages, so we have certain kind of um, guidelines for translating, et cetera, but usually if you work in another language, this is often either the national language, but it's also a written and spoken language. In this community, it was complicated because it's a language that people speak there, but because most of them are not literary, they don't necessarily write in that language. So even if we, and most people who are fairly educated, they study in French, right? So therefore, most of the graduates, uh, you know, graduate students or people from the university, they would be very well versed in French and not so much in written Mure. And in a way, even if we had to write it, nobody would be able to read it. So what we ended up doing, and it was fairly complicated, and again, I don't know if this is the best way of doing it, but this was the only way we could do it. We had to have everything in two languages, like every line was in two languages, right? And then during the training of interviewers, right? So first of all, we had to recruit only those who were uh, fluent in both, right? That was already, you know, a challenge because, again, this is, um, so many just speak French, right? And not necessarily the uh, language of the community, in the capital, I mean. Um, but second, we had to actually kind of train and memorize, so we had to practice a lot uh, just how they would read it, right? So that seemed to be the only way, but we had to kind of keep it in both languages. So we, for the analysis, we used repeated measures, um, mixed effects regression models. We had to adjust for clustering, not only with the over time, but also uh, over clusters, meaning villages. The time by study interaction would serve as the intervention uh, effect. And uh, we also controlled for sociodemographic variables, but we also conducted a moderation analysis to look if the effects of the intervention actually differ by age, gender, and whether it's a polygamous or monogamous uh, study. Okay, moving on to the results. So this is actually when Madame Traore was listening, and I said everyone is when she's speaking, everyone is listening, so that's an example. Right, so these were examples when we were just introducing the study, so would everyone would come together and uh, listen. Actually, maybe here would be a good opportunity to mention it, is when we were thinking of how to compensate families, right, that was a big discussion. And that was an example where sometimes community advisory board is extremely helpful because we were very strong, we had very strong opinions that we had to compensate for interviews. And the local researchers were saying there is no way you can compensate them for the research because, first of all, we never do it, right? Second, 
maybe you have your good rationale, but it said you are setting a precedent, which means next time we want to conduct the study, people would expect something. Maybe not in this village, but somewhere else. And they say, we don't have those resources to conduct studies, right? Third, they said, some families who participated in your study, now they get the money. All their neighbors didn't get anything because they were not in your study. They're going to be jealous. They said, you're going to disrupt the social cohesion that exists in the village, right? Because people see everything. This house is a small. Most of the life is really happening outside, right? So everyone knows everything. What's, so they, 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 they were so against it. It really turned out at a very long discussion. We thought that we felt so terribly not to compensate because we thought we're using a lot of time. These are like long one hour, one and a half hour interviews. We thought mothers could be doing something else during this time, maybe even earning money. And then eventually we said, okay, how about we don't give them money? How about we just give them, we buy them things that they need? Soap, sugar, these seem to be very popular things. Uh, and they said, no. They said, how about you just organize a com because then you said you would still, you know, uh, separate them, right? Just not with money, but with goods. And they say, how about you have a community meal for everyone in the village? And that's what we ended up doing, right? Because so, and it, for me, that was just a very interesting example because, again, I also don't come from individualistic culture, right? I come from a very collective culture. So, uh, but it also thinks that the way we often conduct research, we have certain kind of principles, but we sometimes probably have to be a little bit flexible with them once we do it in a different environment. And I just thought this was a very interesting example for them. This was almost an opportunity to thank the village for welcoming you know, uh, uh, us and also kind of to preserve this cohesion that even if only some people are participating, it is still something that would contribute to everyone in the village. So, Some things on the uh, demographics. So uh, this is for kids. About half of them were not literate. About a quarter have never been to school. And they have several types of schools. So about maybe 60% were going to the classic school. And then a smaller portion were going to religious schools. Madrasas are almost a combination, half classic, half religious studies. But they still cover uh, traditional subjects. The Quranic schools, these are the only ones that study only the religious, uh, the book, the like Quran, and pretty much uh, no classic um, subjects. For mothers, again, I probably shouldn't say mothers, for female caregivers, um, we had a few grandmothers, so that's why the age is so high, but on average they were in around um, 35. Only 3% were able to read and write in any language. Right? So it was either French, Amore, or Arabic. Uh, they were predominantly uh, Muslim of Mosi uh, ethnicity. Almost 40% lived in polygamous marriages with two other wives. And uh, we had very long discussions of what is a household, right? I never thought that we would spend almost a day talking, you know, with a local advisory board. Because they said, but which household do you mean, right, Menage? And because the way people live is, and that's why here we're showing the one that is larger, right? So it could have between four to 27 people. Because on one territory, you could have four different huts, right, or kind of small houses where four different wives would live. And uh, they would leave, you know, the husband would be rotating. So as their responsibilities. So let's say one day on Monday, it's one wife is cooking, the next day it's another one is cooking, right? And the kids would be all together. So the, to understand, and we could only invite only one smaller family to the study, but we also had to understand that everything they do, everything they learn, what they have, what they can put on a table would affect everyone else that they is living together because everything is really shared. So that was just an example that some people, so if you're delivering intervention through one woman, it actually, she lives together with other up to 27 people, right? And that's something that was difficult for us to um, figure out, and I think we kind of learned a, a lot through that. And again, on average, there were at least, you know, five kids in the household. None of the households had electricity, right? These villages don't have any electricity. Most of them were uh, cultivating land. And this was the most you know, surprising thing for me. Uh, almost half had cell phones. And since my other line of research that uh, uh, Colleen mentioned is on digital interventions, right, because I'm very interested in uh, M or kind of mobile interventions that are becoming so profound and they exist everywhere, even where there is no electricity, right? So this is for me a really uh, amazing opportunity, I think, for uh, future 
uh, interventions in some of the low resource settings that even in places where we don't have electricity, we actually could reach them through um, uh, cell phone connections or delivery, use it for the delivery interventions in any other way. And then almost half um, experienced severe hunger, but pretty much 85% said that they uh, went to bed hungry. Almost 70%, no, maybe 45 said that uh, they only eat once a day. So this is, uh, was community where hunger was a very, very big issue. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. Um, so I guess two questions. One, what did you do about the problem that the household is four, but actually 27 people? Did you? So yeah, so what we did, and that was we decided originally, so because we didn't want to invite, let's say, all four wives to the same intervention, right? Because we thought it would be harder to test. So from each household, whether it was polygamous or monogamous, we would still only intervene so far at a smaller household unit, right? Meaning a wife, her kids, and husband, right? So therefore, in the household that was polygamous, since they, when they conducted the poverty uh, ranking exercise, they would determine which one would be in the greatest need, financial need, right? And then they would ask the husband to actually nominate which wife he, he thinks should participate. If it was not the one that we thought was in the uh, group, we would ask him, would you mind if she participates, right? So, and often they would have no big issues, just often initially they would maybe volunteer the first one, right? But basically, um, later we only, in terms of the intervention, we didn't change anything, but we did see that the effects were slightly different, right? Yeah. So the effects were, yes, yes, yes. Because it is, so in, as the design of the intervention, we didn't change it just because we wanted to keep it consistent. In terms of the future recommendations, we see that it is important to modify interventions if it's delivered in a, a polygamous household because then there were also issues of how other wives feel about her participating and there was some kind of issues involved. Mm -hmm. And then um, with the shelter, um, did they find, did So first of all, they're both. They're very cheap because these are not smartphones that we have. These are, you know, often very small Nokia or a Motorola type of phones, you know, flip phones or just simple ones like this. I think I still have one from a long, long time ago. But um, so that's one. Second, it's a survival tool. It's the, because, so that's why out of many other things, if you invest in something, you would invest in cell phones. And they would charge them. They would find like kiosk or there is a shop. They would all come there to charge. But uh, yeah, so it seems to be uh, crucial for so many things um, because that's your connection to other places, even if you're selling things, if you're getting any information, yeah. So that's why it seems like it's a huge, uh, it's a line of support and I think we can go you, uh, beyond using it only for kind of um, survival, right? But also for any kind of socioeconomic uh, behavioral interventions. In terms of uh, ch uh, adverse childhood experiences, they were fairly high. So if you see almost a half of kids reported physical abuse in the family um, and uh, emotional, this is only emotional, so that's on top, right? So this is without physical. About half of them were working and almost half were exposed to hazardous labor. Most of them didn't have any major gender differences except for a couple, first of all. Girls were working more, both in terms of domestic chores Right, so they were working at least, this is a percentage of girls who worked for more than 28 hours a day for like cleaning, taking care of uh, family members, helping cook, uh, washing and et cetera, right? And this is also work besides the domestic chores, right? So this is stuff. As you can see girls, those uh, with asterisks, it's um, significant. Girls always worked more and they were always paid less, right? So that seems to be a fairly universal, um, Pattern? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is baseline. Sorry, I didn't mention it. Yeah. So this is a baseline. Yes. Why were they sent to work? Good point. So they were either helping families or they were helping. Uh, yes. So, but for example, so if um, they could be helping, uh, fam let's say, working in a shop of an uncle. 
Sometimes you could be just helping, but sometimes they would also pay you. You would be more likely to be paid if it's not your family member, right? But yeah. yeah. You didn't um, have a sex abuse question? No, we had to remove that for, uh, again, based on the conversations with it. Because that was a very challenging question for a number of reasons. One, what do you do next if you find out? And we were not prepared to deal with that, just given the resource in it. The only time we asked this question, when it was transactional, when it wasn't a family member, right? So basically, if you were ever asked to you know, uh, exchange it, uh, sex for uh, goods or services, I mean, we didn't ask in that format, but that was the question, right? So, and if it was due, uh, outside, basically in a work setting, if they worked somewhere, so if we went through that uh, module that they were working outside, then we would ask it. But at home, we did not purposefully, yeah. Ah, uh, actually, yeah, at baseline, yes, they were. There were some differences across the villages, and I will mention, but that was primarily related to two things. It's schooling, right? And second is um, uh, working in gold mines or basically being sent to work away for work. And that was a big challenge because it seems like many of them are very structural. So if there was a gold mine nearby, those villages, unfortunately, had significantly higher rates for working in gold mines and lower rates for school. Or if there were no schools in that district. So these were two things where we had a kind of a, a cross-arm uh, differences at baseline. That made it also kind of analyzing educational data a bit more challenging. But. Okay, so since we're focusing primarily on mental health outcomes, I would stay with that. Um, so we looked at uh, three uh, scales, so depression scale, and in addition to the actual score, we also looked at um, the cutoff range, either the standard one from the actual scale or re-standardized uh, using T-score for this specific sample. So you see, again, uh, this one is a little lower if you take into account everyone who's uh, from that sample. And this is for trauma symptoms. Uh, so about maybe 11% you know, experience severe trauma, more severe trauma symptoms, and in the clinical range, the same for depression. Self-esteem, uh, again, this is, seems to be, and it's not the first study where it seems to be maybe not the most indicative variable, mainly because um, the higher self-esteem, the more confident you are, right, is not maybe necessarily the best measure in places where humility and maybe a bit is, is prized, right? So therefore, again, we, we still kept it, but uh, it's not the first time where I see it's not performing that well in terms of not really truly capturing the most difficult situations, right? So, uh, what we also realized that since there were so many different adverse childhood uh, events, right, from violence to um, how many hours they work, if they work under difficult situations, if they also skip school because of this, and et cetera. So we also thought it would not be possible to look at all of them together, and there is also a chance that they actually cluster. You know. So therefore, we conducted a cluster analysis, and this is uh, the paper that we had, and we actually identified like five different groups. And uh, these may not be the best titles, we were not very creative with the names for these groups, but we also saw that there was one group that actually did not have a, any kind of significant experiences with violence, both at home from their parents or once they're away, you know, or not away, sorry, once they are, um, uh, you know, had to work or support. So that was uh, one group. And we saw this is the group that showed the best outcomes in terms of the mental health, right? So it was re associated with a reduced um, uh, scores on trauma symptoms, higher self-esteem, the group that showed the most problematic, I think, uh, s mental health symptomatology were kids who actually reported multiple types of abuses, right? Physical, uh, emotional, and also the ones that have been exploited, who work too much, who've been exposed to a number of different things. And also we had a group that is external labor, that meaning these are the kids who are often sent away, right? And the separation that also puts them at risk. And these are the ones that often also, it, may be associated with a higher risk for depression, trauma, and um, lower uh, self-esteem. In terms of intervention outcomes for uh, caregivers, first of all, in terms of the economic, we saw improvements. So this is basically the economic intervention only compared to control group, and this is economic plus compared to the intervention group. 
So we saw improvements both in the household assets, so basically how many things they had in the household. Now they have a pot. Now they have uh, plates, for example, right? So then they didn't have before. So these we, they basically maybe 10 or 15 different household assets that they had. So we saw improvements in um, both groups. The same goes for savings, just in pure uh, amounts. So um, this was obviously, calc these are the numbers in um, West African francs, but that amount would equal around $50. So this is also savings in terms of the livestock value that they had. Um, and that's also, you can see, uh, close to 120. If you remember, they were only given $100 in the beginning, right? So in a way, they were able to continue generating. And this is just like one year outcomes, actually two years even higher because the intervention was actually for two years. Uh, and also expenditures on children. So economically, we see that they're performing well. Overall, we saw the economic, uh, Effects are fairly similar in both groups, maybe a little bit higher in the economic plus. The hunger score was very interesting, basically food insecurity. Mothers reported a reduction in both faces, right? So they felt that, you know, that they felt less hungry. For kids, interestingly enough, we saw improvements uh, only in the combined group and not in the economic group. And we, were, we couldn't understand why. Any thoughts? Because we asked mothers to report. And then we ask kids to report. Not a thought, but a, a question. So the expenditures on children are less in the plus group, right? Yeah. So that's also an improvement. Yeah, but it's also, we also understood later, right? Because there's actually a little bit more in terms of expenditures because these were just spending more, but these ones also investing more in education. Uh, but in terms of hunger, what turned out to be interesting is that mothers sometimes were using food deprivation as a punishment. So therefore, just because here they had more food, right, it did not really affect the parenting or how kids were treated. Mm -hmm. Here, right, food deprivation seemed no longer to be as a way they would punish the kid, mm -hmm. right? So that was an interesting one that we, again, in the beginning we were puzzled, um, but I think later we, and even the local team, they couldn't understand, and I think uh, later, as we started conducting the interviews and digging more into other types of data that we had, we saw where exactly the changes were happening. So, uh, just very briefly on, the, sure. The hmm? the this is the third group. This is the economic group. I just I don't show the control. I'm sorry. The, uh, the control, yeah, I don't show because basically these are effects compared to the control. Compared to the where they began Com over time compared to the control. So both, because the intervention effect is the really interaction over time by study assignment. So it's basically the change in between uh, baseline and time in one group compared to the other. Yeah. Because let's say if the control group behave better, right, then these would be in the opposite direction. Right? So that means they would be less than in a control if control group was better. So in terms of the women's empowerment, so we also saw uh, improvements in um, financial autonomy, women's ownership of assets, because that was a tricky one as well. Because when we were asking, does the household have a cell phone, right? Then we would ask, does a woman either have a cell phone or has access to that cell phone? Because those were two, two different things, right? And that was very, very important. Uh, because you could have money, you had, you, but you may not spend them, or you need to get a permission. Then. Another one that was actually very, very interesting, uh, and that seemed to be actually related later to many uh, outcomes, is the improved uh, marital relationships, right? And again, we see changes in terms of the adults or caregivers, we see changes fairly similar in both groups. There were less conflicts in the family, better relationships, and the main thing, even the mental health outcomes for moms, so they saw a reduction in stress level and in depression in both groups. This is a one year follow up, for, yes. For yeah, this is for all of them. It's just for the next one, we have two years, both, okay? And just for this one, in that specific paper, we only had one year follow up. But they're fairly consistent with what we see in, in year two. So when it comes to kids, so overall, the story we see, the intervention economic was primarily targeting, that was delivered in both groups, targeting adults, seemed to be working, right? So they felt 
better, they felt rest relieved. Remember, originally we were thinking of parental stress, how that is induced by poverty. So if you reduce a little bit the poverty, and we saw it was a little bit reduced, right? It does actually alleviate the stress from the family, and that improves the relationship between mom and dad, and also how mom feels in general, right? So, interestingly enough, once we start looking at kids, and here it's slightly different table, but I will guide you through. So this is now trickle up the economic versus control. This is trickle up plus versus control. And this is economic plus versus economic only, right? Little difficult to follow, but I'll guide you through. Again, the, maybe not the numbers themselves that matter, but the conclusions. So what we see is that the effects on kids were actually non apparent in the economic intervention only. They were no matter which outcomes we looked at, that even though there were so many outcomes changed for adults, right, we see on both groups, once we started looking at kids, we almost saw no significant changes in the economic group only, right, and that's that line. Once we started looking at the combined one compared to the control, that's where we started seeing changes. And that's both, yes. This is for at 12 months, and this is at, tw at 12, uh, sorry, 12, 24. This is for depression. This is for trauma at 12 and at uh, 24. This is physical violence at 12 months and 24, and emotional violence, right? So what we saw is that we saw improvements in, in uh, emotional well-being of kids in the combined intervention, and they were consistent both at one year and two year follow-ups, at least for depression. And we see that they were significantly stronger, at least for this specific variable, between the um, economic and the combined intervention, right? Not only it was higher compared to control, it was also significantly better compared to the uh, group that was receiving economic intervention only, okay? We also saw that in addition to improvements in depression and trauma symptoms, we also saw a reduction in physical abuse that kids were experiencing and also in emotional abuse, right? So these are odds ratios, so therefore they are uh, zeros. Yes, yes. Because if you remember, the intervention was for two years, right? And for things like this to start changing, um, and that's why I earlier showed you improvements in well-being of the mothers, and they were primarily around. So once they start happening, so because for business to pick up, you need time. It's not going to pick up in a month or two, right? And at least, you know, when we were looking at maybe one year follow-up, we started seeing that mothers are doing a little bit better, right? Maybe they're handling things a little bit better, and things started changing them. And therefore, over time, we start seeing that may potentially translate into improved well-being for kids. Because what is not here, but we also looked at harsh discipline for moms reports. That was also reduced and only reduced in this group, not in the economic one. We also looked at normative beliefs around parenting and attitudes. Let's say, should girls be, if you have a choice uh, you know, to invest in a boy or a girl, would you prefer a boy right, to put in school or um, uh, a few other things related to education or labor? Right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there could be a couple of explanations. So first, we already see that it's trending in the same direction. So we already see it's lower. They're just not significant, right? So they're just a little higher, but they're, uh, they're higher than this level, but they're still on the lower side, lower than one, okay, in both cases, right? So that's one. Second, the way we measure depression, that was another, again, interesting question, I think, especially people in uh, kind of global mental health, is that a lot of questions ask things. You're not able to concentrate, right? You feel uh, tired and fatigued and lethargic, right? So you don't have energy. Many of them could be related to food intake, right? So these some, some somatic symptoms, they often may not be necessarily an indication of your emotional well-being, right? But again, at the same time, we also see that, um, and that is partially taking place. So what's interesting about the economic piece is that there are some trends in those directions, they just don't fully reach the potential. And that's why, as we'll mention in the, in the uh, conclusion section, is that 
my assumption is that um, we cannot do without the economic because there's a big question is about what if we just deliver the family, you know, coaching and we're good, right? And then let's think about it and discuss it at, at, the, uh, at the end because that's often a question because say if you don't see any changes in the economic piece, in the economic only, right, then just do the plus part. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, last thing that I wanted to mention in terms of the analysis, and this is still work in progress, so we are uh, working on a mediation paper because one thing is like we, these were our kind of hypothetical assumptions that this is how we performs, right? But that's what we're trying to test. So this is just a draft uh, model. So we were primarily looking at child mental health as our final outcome, right? With depression, self-esteem, and trauma as, you know, the key components. And then abuse seemed to be playing the biggest role, and that was the main connective. I don't have the lines here, but I will explain them. So in both physical and emotional abuse that kids report, and these are the kids' reports, right? It seemed to be one of the strongest factors that predict the child mental health. The deprivation on the household level that is primarily determined by household assets and the hunger score uh, of the family. Um, surprisingly, that doesn't have actually direct impact on child well, emotional well-being. So just because the child lives in poverty doesn't automatically make him depressed or, or stressed, right? So that was an interesting. So what's interesting for us was that this was a serial mediation model, meaning that it really interacts through a couple of other things. And one thing that the deprivation primarily affects is the maternal distress, is how moms feel themselves, right? Being constantly stressed and thinking, what do they need to do that they are not able to be good parents because they can't put food on a table, right? And that eventually affects her interactions with the kid, partially, right? And how they feel. And also the overall family environment. And that is not only uh, attitudes, because a lot of organizations are trying to teach and change norms among parents, that beating is not good, it really doesn't affect your kids' you know, well-being. But we see that there are a few other things. So it's also the uh, marital relationship in the household with the husband, right? And that's it seems to be very strongly connected. So the deprivation really improves this area. And altogether, they actually reduce the abuse and then uh, improve their well-being, right? Um, what did we learn? Many things, but I think in terms of uh, at least what do we need to do if we uh, try to improve emotional well-being in low resource settings and especially in settings of chronic adversity? Uh, we learned a couple of things. Once, if you only look at economic intervention, and that seemed to be very important for us. So we were not looking at um, only at family coaching because purely from theoretical perspective, because we saw that if people are struggling, if people are hungry, it would be almost impossible to organize them and say, let's come together for sessions, right? So we will talk about how you should uh, raise your kids, right? It would be very difficult to do it in terms of engagement because they would not show up, right? And second, it would be even difficult for people to focus, to stay really uh, connected. Once you have the economic program that serves almost as a First of all, engagement tool, because everyone sees the tangible uh, effects of the economic empowerment, right? Then, and plus, it also addresses the almost like the biological foundation that what happens with the way we can handle stress, right? Even on biological level, if you live in a, a condition of a, a chronic um, hunger or even chronic stress, because you may not be hungry, but you're constantly stressed about what to do. So that seemed to be for us very foundational, right? But it also shows that maybe that's just not entirely sufficient, right? Because what we saw is that the group solidarity really was very important for mothers. They were very happy to be engaged together with other mothers. They reported that the uh, level of kind of the parental stress and the things that they had to buy or put on the table um, have reduced and their emotional well-being have improved. They also felt a little bit more uh, financially independent um, um, that they could at least contribute to the household income. But what also we notice that the burden of household activities partially shifts to kids. Because if mom is busy now selling things or working more, attending workshops, someone still needs to do other activities. And who does it usually do? Girls. And not just any girls, it's the teenage girls. 
So this is sometimes a little bit of a danger of only providing economic activities because now they're very common, right? Economic interventions are everywhere. But what we don't realize is that it also shifts the family dynamics that yes, mothers are engaged and they're doing more, but those household things, they don't disappear. Someone has to do them. And that someone often would be kids, right? So that's why delivering this without actually adding something else could be not necessarily only helping, but could potentially also put uh, add additional risks. What we learn in terms of the family coaching is that um, uh, families realize that they could actually explain things or achieve certain things with kids without necessarily uh, using violence. Again, we don't say it disappeared, but at least it started uh, going down. Um, what they also loved is that, and that was surprising, for, especially for kids, because not only husbands were happy that they were involved, because before, if you only deliver women's intervention, they automatically feel excluded. Right? And they often already don't like what you're offering to women because they say, how come we're not a part of it? Right? Even if it's the most wonderful intervention, they just feel why we cannot be a part of it. Right? So I think here that really helped us to connect and put the, everything in perspective that it's really more for the family rather than just for the woman. But kids were particularly excited because it was the first time when they were actually able to sit and act, not maybe even actively participate, but be a part of the discussion. Because before, this is a fairly you know, hierarchical structure within families, and they're often excluded. So for them, that really opened up and created a new opportunity when they could be a part of this um, sessions and maybe sometimes even express their opinions. Um, in terms of limitations, what we learned, there are many structural factors that unfortunately that still doesn't address, right? And, and therefore, uh, it is important to think of maybe additional interventions because if it's a small market, it's hard to continue selling things if you engage pretty much everyone in, you know, in economic intervention. And also, it's harder to motivate to send people, kids to school when there are not enough schools around, right? Especially for certain ages. In terms of family components, oh, in terms of the study, uh, our limitations were that we only had a limited number of villages, which limited our cluster and power. Also, the, uh, we only unfortunately relied at this point on self-reported measures and now kind of biological measures of you know, child's growth, because that would be also, I think, quite interesting. Again, difficulty coming up with kind of more culturally congruent tools that would capture all the things that I mentioned earlier. And uh, one thing that was also important here is the seasonality. Some things, for example, school attendance drops at certain period of time, right? So uh, when people are farming. So for us, again, we tried to adjust it by doing, conducting interviews always at the same time of the year, but that would not capture everything that was happening, let's say, six months from now, okay? So again, what have we learned and uh, where do we take it from here? We see that economic interventions are really critical if you work in uh, low resource communities. Um, they help really um, improve parental well-being, both in terms of reducing their parental stress uh, and improving their empowerment status, but it actually, only by itself, it can have a very limited effect on kids. And by integrating and engaging all family members, right, and um, integrating the kind of the family-based components, we could achieve uh, improved outcomes for kids. The other thing that we also learned from moderation analysis, we always have to take into account the context-specific modifications. Just I mentioned an example of uh, polygamous families that we need to modify the intervention and maybe obviously cannot deliver the same um, thing to everyone. So um, the study was funded through the um, Child and um, Violence Fund that is comprised of several organizations um, and housed by um, Network of European Foundation. But I just wanted to mention for Chaz that even though they did not fund this study, they're actually funding another study that I am conducting in Azerbaijan with uh, kids from uh, institutions that is also looking at a similar model where we integrate economic uh, strategies together with the kind of family uh, strengthening strategies. So, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um. 
to prepare. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe this is actually what's going on, but it's possible. No, but as researchers, we have to be open yeah, to all the possibilities, all percentage explanations. And uh, first of all, it is possible. And all, I think, uh, research that we conduct, kind of, at least in the field of self work, we often rely on self report, and that's a problem, and therefore we do try to at least incorporate something else. But in this situation, so people who were conducting interventions were obviously not the same people who were conducting interviews. Right? So that's one thing. Uh, but in a way, I do see where you're saying that they kind of became more aware of those topics and therefore they could be more sensitive to giving us more kind of a socially desirable uh, information. Well, the only difficulty. Yes, uh, and we, I got those. Then, then probably would not improve. Um, yeah. But I, I still, I want to say this is extremely impressive to you. I can't Yes, please remind me. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. You, you kind of mentioned this a little bit in terms of, in terms of the larger household, the larger households, the millions of households, and so you did interviews as well. Were there conversations about how that was maybe different, how that one way and you talked about sort of identifying the white that was more economic and now you sort of lifting the status of the family? Can you talk a little bit about that? That's actually a very, very good question. And uh, now, first of all, what I didn't mention is that in addition to um, this quantitative interviews, we also conducted a qualitative piece, right? I was not the one who doing it, was already the local organization in Burkina Faso that conducted qualitative interviews, and that's where they were able to capture this additional information because in the qualitative interviews, we highly encouraged them to interview not only mothers and the kid because we kind of had to go with them, but to also interview husbands and interview other wives. And that's where the issues came out that, yes, there was some sense of, I wouldn't say jealousy, but maybe jealousy together with tensions is why we're not selected, why we didn't participate, right? And that does change the status a little bit because technically most women, if it was a polygamous household, most women who were selected, they were at the lower status on the order because they have a kind of order in terms of uh, the wives, who comes from what kind of family, what they bring with them, right, um, and et cetera. So that was uplifting her status a little bit, but it was also creating the tension. So therefore, again, if we were to deliver it again, we would probably have to deliver to all four, or basically how many families are there, and that's where I said it has to be modified given the circumstances. And this is just in line with the original comment that I made about um, collective culture that here is a place where you're gonna lose by trying to identify who is at higher risk, but other people could be at the similar risk, just very, very close. So instead of taking that risk, it's just better to deliver it to everyone. So if there are resources, I agree that it's better to do it together and then see um, that it improves the dynamic, but it's also why it was also difficult to see the effects. And I mentioned some effects were a little bit low in polygamous families because you, whatever economic resources you got, you don't only share it with two or three of your kids, you share it with maybe seven others, which means they're gonna be diffused. So you're gonna see less impact, but not because it didn't produce it, it was just distributed it to more people. And therefore, we also, just one thing to add on the polygamous, that um, the same happened with um, uh, harsh discipline. Right? We did not see confirmation of reports from kids that the violence reduced because why, if the mom who participated in the sessions, her behavior has changed, mm -hmm. but the same kid is parented by others as well. Right? It's not just his mom because other wives have the right to tell them something because they all live kind of together. And because they were not a part of the same, let's say, program, their behavior did not change as much. Maybe it changed a little because there are some conversations, but not to the same level. So that's another way where we saw that like, Parenting, especially strict and harsh parenting, did not change much in the polygamous households. And the effects were stronger in monogamous, yes. Yeah, these are impressive results, but what is the, do you have an estimate of the investment cost per household? We do, oh. yes, we actually do. We, it's in the paper. Okay. The investment per house, and I can pull it up, but the best part is the difference for the economic plus group is $8 per family. $8 per family is the difference. So let's say roughly, I don't remember the number, it's in the paper because it was one of the comments from your viewers we had to say. Let's say roughly, I think it was 200, we're just saying roughly, I don't remember exactly the number, maybe it's 
per family for the economic piece. And 208 or 228 is the second intervention. Why? Because people would ask, in a way, how could it be that cheap? Because it's delivered through local uh, facilitators who live in the community, right? And usually um, in uh, lower resource settings, human resources are often very cheap and not expensive. They don't have to travel much. They don't get paid so much. So in a way, uh, it is not a very costly intervention. They, look, they don't have to have cars and things like that. One last question I think we need to do. So that one is a good one. So two things. So we have a separate paper that looks at child labor, and we did see a reduction both for child labor and for uh, involvement in hazardous labor and violence at work, right? So and again, that is in the combined. For school, it was a little bit problematic. So first of all, um, we had um, main uh, major differences across villages, right? Primarily two, because they were further a little bit away, and that's where they had fewer schools. So that one was the challenge. The only one we saw in terms of the schools is that more families started, kids who were never been in school, now they started going more to religious school rather than to classic, mm -hmm. right? And that's why, again, the way we interpret it is that if there are no schools and still not sufficient funds, families realize at least I send them to any kind of school than no school at all, right? And then at least to madrasas, the engagement has increased a bit. But again, they were, it was more um, messier than we wanted to be. That's okay, it. I think um, we have to finish. Thank you so much. Thank you.